Hello and welcome. Thank you all for being here. We're going to wait one more second while more folks join. I see, I can see that people are joining now. So if you just give me one more second, we'll wait for those stragglers to get in. But thank you all for being here. We're excited about this program and to have you all here today. My colleague Tara is in the chat as well, so she'll be posting some things that's important information about the speakers, about where to find them, about the information they're referring to. So welcome her as well. Tara, thank you so much. Um, and we'll get going in about five seconds. Great. Hello and welcome. My name is Jay Rosenthal. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Business of Cannabis. Welcome to our second monthly retail series of 2022. And this one is really, really topical. Today we'll hear about the new guidance from Ontario regulators about how brands and retailers should, could, may, and are likely to engage. So 2017 through news, insights, video, and podcast series, as well as events, Business of Cannabis has highlighted the companies, brands, people, and trends driving the cannabis industry, which we look to do here again today and every day. As we begin, we wish to acknowledge this land on which we live and work here in Toronto. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. This year, our retail series is made possible by our friends at Leafly and Vitrina. If you're a retailer or a would-be retailer, I strongly encourage you to learn about the critical role Leafly plays in supporting retailers and driving business at leafly.com. We are thankful for their ongoing support to make this happen. And you'll hear from Vitrina Group in a moment with Krista. Uh, but it's not just those two that make everything we do here at Business of Cannabis possible. Our ongoing partners include Can Delta, Torque and Mains, Cannabis Benchmarks, Gallagher in Canada, Headset, and Cannabis at Work. And so we will post the, how to get in touch with those folks uh, in the chat uh, today. Just a bit of an overview about today's program. In a moment, we'll be joined by Krista Raymer of Vitrina Group to talk through the absolutely critical brand retailer relationship, why it matters, and how it helps retailers succeed. Immediately after that, we actually have a sneak pre peek world premiere of a new project we're working on with Krista called the Expert Series. The first series is focused on retail. There'll be other experts on as well, but first we're going to focus on retail. You're going to see a world premiere in just a few minutes, about a four and a half minute spot, but I think you'll like it and we're going to roll out the full suite of it next week, but you and this event will be the first to see it. Following this session with Krista, we'll sit down with two of the most thoughtful and diligent minds in the cannabis business, Matt Maurer from Torque and Mains and Lucas McCann from Candelta, to walk us and talk us through where we stand today with regards to inducements, training, sampling, in-store advertisements, white label, white labeling, and much, much more in Ontario specifically, and uh, what will stay the same or change come June 30th based on some new guidance over the past few weeks. As always, after the main stage program of the event, we'll open up the breakout session so you go face-to-face -face with the speakers and presenters, have questions asked and answered, and we'll also open up the one-on-one -on -one networking component. We like to call it the businessy speed dating. Others call it high-speed dating. That's the pun they like to use because of cannabis, but it's a great opportunity to meet someone else who is in the program with us or join us in the session to go face-to-face -face with our speakers. During the program, as I mentioned, you'll see my colleague, Tara McManus, uh, who will be posting updates in the chat. Be sure to say hi to her over there, and she'll be sharing lots of good information as we go. Give me one moment, and I'll be right back with Krista Raymer, the founder of Vitrina Group, an industry-leading cannabis retail consultancy. And immediately that, we'll follow that with a, a sneak peek at our expert series about retail. I'll be back in one moment with Krista Raymer. Krista Raymer from Vitrina Group, Yay. thank you for being here. We're back at it again for February for our retail series. Thank you yeah. again for your partnership on this. I don't tell anybody, but this is my favorite thing we do every month. Wow, that's a, you're letting a secret out of the bag. It's mine too. <laughs> I, I feel like because I feel like I am uh, as much a viewer and learner as a participant or producer of it, because I do learn a lot. I learn a lot from you and from Leafly, our other partners, but um, and it's good to sort of do this on a monthly basis. And today, we, as you know, we're talking about sort of brands and retailers, mm -hmm. the importance of that relationship. And in a minute, we'll get Matt Maurer and Lucas McCann to talk about sort of what Ontario is saying about new rules and regulations, but sort mm -hmm. of high level. Yeah. 
what is the, like, how important is the brand retailer relationship overall and maybe specifically in Canada right now? Well, I think like first we need to understand how we got here. And if we look back, the number of brands and products that were available to retailers for the last two and a half, three years has been very limited. Um, we had a handful of SKUs in each category and you brought products to market and they would sell through in retail and then we were good to go. The reality is as the boards add density in terms of the number of products and their assortment starts to deepen, as a retailer, your assortment starts to deepen or has. And so now you have a number of products in store that potentially cross over in terms of how they're related or how your customer understands them. So now we're in the spot where it becomes so important for a retailer to really understand what a licensed producer or brand is offering to the end user customer, and then is able to translate that through. Now, the reality is, is in practice, this seems like pretty straightforward. You're like, here's some features and benefits about our product, and here is how you sell it at retail. The difficulty though, is that we have sales teams who are working on this, sales agencies who are picking up these products and communicating with retailers, and that we need to be super localized in what is happening at retail level. So this is a really hard process to scale easily. Where the opportunity becomes is to understand what are the problems and the opportunities that retailers are facing today? What do they hear from our customers? Um, and then what is the information that helps us differentiate within the market? Not necessarily that we think is different in the market, but how our end user customer will understand it, because that's what we have to translate at retail. There are two stakeholders in a retail environment. There is the person who is making an inventory purchasing decision. That needs one type of communication from a licensed producer or brand. And then there are your bud tenders who are in direct communication with your customer. Totally different level. An inventory and assortment person might be really interested in gross margin, whereas a bud tender wants to be able to clearly identify what the feature and benefit is for the end user customer. So we've got to think about how we can be very specific with the information that we're offering. And, you know, the number of stores, and we're talking specifically about Ontario today, like it's just gone through the roof. So talking about doing yes. all those things at scale from a brand or licensed producer perspective got, you know, there's a hundred percent more stores now than there were a year ago, mm -hmm. maybe even more. And mm -hmm. the number of SKUs and brands and licensed producers gone up exponentially too. Mm -hmm. and like that's from a, you know, even one of those stakeholder relations for a buyer perspective or an inventory manager perspective, but then the number of Bud tenders is also sort of skyrocketed, you know, exponentially. Like mm -hmm. it's, it, and I wonder, like it, it makes all those things much more challenging. And then on top of that, sort of the regulatory changes, the regulatory guidance that we've heard from Ontario makes it even more challenging. So if I am, let's let's say, like if if I if you had a retail store, Krista Ramers mm -hmm. Cannabis Retail in I don't know, let's say Barry, mm -hmm. um, like what would how would you what would be most beneficial to you as a shop owner? what you're hearing from brands and how you might actually work together with them on their products to make a better experience for the customer. As a retailer, I would be communicating back what holes in my assortment there are um, and how I'm wanting to fill them so that when I'm sitting down and having a conversation with a licer, licensed producer or brand, I'm able to say, hey, this is a gap in my offering. Do you have something that is going to help me? Or this is something that I'm like ready to switch out and I'm wanting to offer some newness in this category. What are you having to offer? Basically what we're doing is doing an interview about like what products do you have? What products do I want? And how is this assortment as an overall? One of the patterns that we have seen, and this has happened in the US and will continue to happen in Canada, is that more products come to the market and then retailers carry more and more and more SKUs. The difficulty with that is that then you just end up with more slow moving SKUs because our customers are looking often for newness um, and or that is also the products that our bartenders communicate about most frequently. And so um, we've got to combat both of that by being able to say what goes in must come out. And meaning like, what are the total number of SKUs on store, in store? How do we keep that dialed in? Um, and then where are our true gaps in offering so that we can fill them accordingly? Do I need a particular ounce that is um, of a particular price point and has maybe particular strain details? Um, 
and being able to be like be that dialed in so that it is really filling in the blank of our inventory and our assortment. But like, we have to also have an idea from the brands of what's coming down the market. Like what is going to impact inventory and assortment at our, at our um, board level, because that is an entire other right. complexity to this. And we're, we see it again in markets as they open up in the U S too. Like these, these problems play out consistently. And so it becomes now about how you manage your vendor relationships. Whereas historically it was just like what was available you bought. Yeah. I mean, that's great to hear because I think from a couple of perspectives, one, I think brands are getting more used to sort of how this relationship works. Retailers, I think are probably demanding that they get better at how the relationship works. But, or, and like, and it's getting more complex because there's the board in between, there's this, you know, incredibly number of new brands and SKUs and more competition. And I'm learning as a store owner, sort of what moves, what doesn't, where the margins come from, how I can train my staff. Like it's more than three-dimensional chess. It's like four-dimensional chess. And there's a time horizon on it as well, uh, which is why, uh, you know, this is why we do the series, right? So people can sort of learn in different chunks. And even as you spoke, I mean, we've, um, we've done a bunch with you around inventory, right? And like yes. breaking down the categories to like subcategories or sub subcategories. So yeah, even what you described, like flour in a large format of different strains, like that's, you know, you start to like, okay, that's our large format flour you know, category, which is different and apart from the, the one and three and a half and, and seven grams, which are each of their own subcategories. Mm -hmm. And like with, even within that, there's the premium and value, like all those things. I guess what I'm saying, it's not easy. <laughs> no, no. And like the number of formats that were available also have switched. Like last summer, most of the beverages that were in stores were carbonated and, um, and looked a particular way or had a particular outcome for the customer we are going to see a lot of new and interesting products come to market in specifically in edibles and in beverages. And they represent only a portion of the revenue in store. And so as a retailer, how do you make relationships with the vendors to be able to bring in the right product for your customer? And, and that is, that is where this complexity gets crazy. Oh, it's, it's even going to get more complex when you do, <laughs> when we talk to Lucas and Matt, that the, the, the rules and regs are actually changing or have changed or clarity. Right. And, and like some of the things you might've been doing, you can still do. Some of the things yeah. that you actually were doing, you can't do, but also like mm -hmm. the education of bun tenders is gonna be, is much more clarified. What happens on shelf is much more clarified, although potentially negative. Um, white labeling products, like we'll get into all that, but like, it just, it's, it's a challenging environment all the time. As yeah. you just said, even in, in more mature markets, but for Ontario retailers or those would be Ontario retailers, like it's, it's been a tough go. And it'll continue to be, even if the market sort of saturates, we get to a point like it, what you're saying is many of these complexities exist in even in more mature markets. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody is after data, like, and the new regulations also start to spell out what, like what that can look like. I think it doesn't matter necessarily from my perspective, exactly how the regulations have changed. What matters is saying, what is the data that is going to help us make better um, insights and then take those insights and turn them into action. And that information might not be the same for every single brand and licensed producer. And so really like in an environment that would be more traditional retail, we would start to build out scorecards for our vendors and, and score them on how the product is performing at store or what they're supplying us. And they can score us back as a vendor too. Like as a retailer, I can be held accountable for what I'm doing. Is the product sell through in my store really good for your brand? Like, and this is where it's going to get very complex is that in some spaces you might end up with incredible velocity with like smaller groups and you might end up with slow velocity with larger groups or vice versa. And so it's like, how do we start to navigate that and just the level of complexity in terms of total number of stores, to your point, total number of products available, total number of people entering the space in terms of this being like their full-time profession has impacted all of this. And um, so it requires you to be on your feet. I like that. And um, I want to give the folks that are here a sneak preview of something. Are you ready? Oh. So we spent a couple days in a studio, Krista, because we are rolling out on Monday, something called the expert series. You are the retail expert and we are rolling out a whole series with you 
talking about different facets of cannabis retail. The first one is about floor plan. And I bring that up because you just said insights, uh, data and insights, insights into action, which is actually part of what we're going to be talking about. Can I roll the first one as well? Say goodbye and thank you to you and roll the first episode that we're going to roll out on Monday as a sneak peek to this audience. Sure. I, I'm really excited. Yeah. So, I'm, yeah. I'm really excited too. It is a great <laughs> series. There's only a couple of people that have seen all of them. Obviously the team that's been working on it, but it, you, I mean, obviously you are the retail expert. We've proven that you've shared all your stuff um, and, and we're excited to roll this in a moment. And then I'll be back to introduce uh, the panel, but I want to thank you for, for this conversation, for your participation, the retail expert, and for um, being a partner on this retail series. Uh, thanks, Krista. Thanks, Jay. I'm really looking forward to the next part of this combo. And roll it. Hi, I'm Krista, the founder of Vitrina Group, and we work with cannabis retailers and licensed producers to take data, turn it into insights, and insights into action points. Today, we're going to talk about some of the key areas of retail with the business of cannabis and how we can make these environments better. So today we're going to talk about floor plans, why they're important and how they impact your business, how we measure whether we need to make a change, and some tips and tricks for when you are planning your environment. First, a floor plan is really a map of where everything is going to go in store. This includes lighting, fixtures, and maybe even electrical outlets. It's really important to think about all of the details prior to committing to organizing the store so that we can get all of the pieces of the retail environment in the right place for the right time. Why this is important is because the floor plan is going to directly connect with your customer and guide the customer through the store, which ultimately influences what products they see, when they see them in their journey in the store, and what opportunities our bud tenders have to interact with our customers. So second, we're gonna think about how we measure floor plans and what impact they actually have on the business. A floor plan is going to create discovery with our customers. And if we're doing a really great job with discovery, then we should also be able to influence what KPIs or key performance indicators are going to show up in our numbers. The floor plan is gonna directly impact the quality of sale. So that means our average per customer and our units per transaction are really great ways to measure if we have the right product in the right place in the right time in our cannabis retail store. If we see a change in our average per customer or our units per customer, we might want to make an adjustment as to the way that our customer travels through the store. This could include moving fixtures or repositioning cash desks to ensure that we are getting our customer all the way through the environment. Another area that we can check in the store to see if we're doing a really great job with the floor plan or layout is checking if our customers are using the whole store. An often KPI that we see used to measure the success of a retail environment is sales per square foot. And so our floor plan is going to directly impact where those sales are happening. Okay, so let's talk about some tips and tricks when we think about floor plans for cannabis retail stores. First one is that we should always be including a decompression zone. A decompression zone is that fancy space right after the entrance that allows our customer to really take in the entire environment. They're about to go on a journey, and so we need them to acclimatize and see the entire store from that, that viewpoint. One of the areas that you could think about this is in a grocery store, right after you enter those first double doors, you can see the entire store. We want to do the same thing. The second tip is that customers in North America or people who generally drive on the right side of the road tend to always go right. This means that if we position fixtures, for example, on the left-hand side early in the customer journey, they tend not to get seen. So we want to focus on where our fixtures are going to go and anticipate that our customers are always going to go right. One of the ways that we might want to measure this is when we think about our average sale per square foot. This would be an indicator of how well we are driving revenue throughout the entire environment. And if we're paying rent, we want to be driving revenue throughout the entire environment. And finally, we want to make a consideration about if we're creating an environment that creates a highway to the cash desk. This essentially is a straight line that our customer can go from the front door all the way to the cash desk without interacting with anything in the retail environment. This is detrimental to the average per customer because we haven't created an opportunity for the customer to explore what other products we have in the store. 
And so what we want to be able to do is break up those lines with fixtures or other aspects within our retail environment to guide our customer through the store before they get to the cash. Thanks for joining us today. If you have more questions or want to know how to drive a profitable retail environment in cannabis, you can reach out to me directly at Vitrina Group. We have more awesome content just like this that will be on businessofcannabis.com. Thank you, Kristen. We hope you enjoyed the expert series, that little sneak peek, which will launch in full. There are six episodes, I believe, they'll launch next week. I'm now pleased to welcome our panel to the stage, or so-called stage, here online. First, Matt Maurer, who is a partner at Torque and Mains. He's the co-chair of their cannabis law group and the chair of their franchise law group. He's also an accomplished trial and appellate lawyer in the litigation group with over a decade of experience advocating on behalf of of his business clients. He's a must listen to voice in the Canadian cannabis sector. We're proud to call him a partner of Business of Cannabis and we're proud to welcome him back today for this retail series. He'll be joined or will all be joined by Lucas McCann. Um, uh, Dr. Lucas McCann, PhD, is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Candelta, where he provides scientific oversight on all projects. A medicinal organic chemist by training, that's no small feat. He acquired regulatory knowledge within the regulatory and operations enforcement branch uh, of health products at Health Canada. Pretty good background for the cannabis industry as well, before leaving the public sector and moving into the cannabis consulting space. He and his team have deep knowledge of the regulations governing the full supply chain of both cannabis and psychedelics in Canada. We're proud to call him and his team partners as well. I'll be right back with Matt and Lucas, so stay put. Lucas and Matt. Welcome. Hello, Jay. Hey, Jay. Hey, Hi. Um, uh, I like talking to both of you. Generally, we're uh, more one-on-one, -on -one, and sometimes uh, we're recording, and sometimes just for uh, to get background information. But uh, within the past couple of weeks, and maybe one of you will tell me exactly how long, we all received new guidance from the AGCO about what is allowed, what is disallowed, which is why we're, we're grouping here today. Lucas, give us a little bit of what we actually like what they did, and then we'll talk about the details. Like what, 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 what did they release? Sure, that's a great question, Jay. So if you were to look online now, you actually wouldn't see any changes to the registrar standards, uh, but the AGCO had put out a 30-day consultation uh, last year in, I believe it was uh, July. Uh, July 23rd, a 30-day email uh, consultation went up from the AGCO in which they were contacting retailers to get some more information about inducements, uh, particularly Registrar Standard 6.4. Uh, that sort of went silent and off the radar for a while. And then there was another email communication that only went to retailers about now how they've invoked some changes or will be invoking changes to the Registrar Standards, namely Section 6.4, 6.5, 6.6, and a new standard 8.1. Point one zero, uh, which speaks to how um, retailers and LPs can interact as it pertains to advertising, uh, marketing, uh, and what constitutes uh, an inducement. So uh, that information is not available on the web right now. So if you'd missed this email communication, you wouldn't see it entirely. Uh, and that won't be available uh, online until it becomes uh, into force, which will be June 30th of this year when they'll start enforcing it. Okay, so June 30th is when they'll start enforcing it. It was all about inducements. It's not on the website and you had to get the email to understand it. Right. All those things aside, which is, um, I don't wanna, it's not a great way to um, let uh, stakeholders know, but that aside, this might be. So thank you for being here and sharing light. Matt, as you received it or looked at it, what is the one or two things that struck you right off the bat? And again, then we'll get into sort of more specifics about in-store, bud tender education, white labeling, all that stuff. But but when you saw these come out, what, what struck you right off the bat? Yeah, I, I talked to the AGCO last July, uh, just before the consult came out. Um, and what they had said to me then was, there was a lot of ambiguity about what is a material inducement. So the existing standard says, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, retailers can't accept a material inducement from a licensed producer. And the question, you know, since that standard came out is what's material and clearly some things are material and clearly some things are immaterial and it's all the things in between that you know where all the questions are so they were looking to sort of um, 
get some more clarity and give some more guidance on what is a material inducement. And so what they did, and you know, we'll talk about this in more detail, but what struck me, you know, is that they've, they've literally come out and said, these, you cannot have any agreements with licensed producers if you're a retailer, unless it meets one of the following exceptions. It's almost like the promotional rules in the federal act that says, you can't promote anything unless you meet one of these exceptions. So, you know, it was, I'm all for having some more guidance, some more clarity, and everyone knows what the rules are. Um, you know, the listing out of the categories of agreements or the exceptions, if you will, um, struck, stuck out to me. And the white labeling in particular was something that jumped out to me as well as, you know, many clients we have. Can we talk about that white labeling, maybe specifically, Lucas, is that like, because we had it, you joined us on BFC Live to talk a little bit about this uh, a couple weeks ago, but is that, I'm a retailer, I want to put Jay Rosenthal branded cannabis on my own shelves or any shelves, and now I'm not allowed to do that after June 30th, is that right? Yeah, 100%. Uh, we, we did see that there were retailers coming out with branded uh, cannabis products, and cannabis accessories to, again, promote their retail brand. Uh, I would imagine that there are several that have entered into agreements already with LPs for, for production of these products. What we're seeing now with the, invoca with the um, uh, invoking this change is that uh, those retailers will no longer be able to produce any more products with their name and brand uh, elements on them, and uh, they'll be allowed to sell basically what inventory they have left, and then after that, that's it. Can I ask and, a very, sorry, go ahead, Matt. Well, yeah, I was just, I was just gonna add, you know, what kind of struck me about this is, and Lucas described it perfectly accurately. It's interesting that, you know, these, these retailers can still have accessories um, because of prohibitions on a licensed producer. So when I read this, you know, my first thinking was, well, what's the point of this? And I actually spoke to the AGCO briefly after um, this email came out to ask them about it. Um, because, you know, let's pick, uh, Let's pick no one, so we're being fair to all the retail. Let's pick Jay's Cannabis Shop. How about I like that? It. Uh, I thought you would. Um, you know, Jay's Cannabis Shop can have lighters branded with his name on it or with its name on it, if you will. Um, all kinds of accessories, whatever you want. But if you wanted Jay's Cannabis pre-rolls, that suddenly is something that can't be done. And what struck me as sort of odd about it is, in my experience, these white labeling agreements are not the type of things where an LP is trying to get themselves into the store, get themselves into the good graces of the retailers. These are agreements that are being sought out by retailers, some of them, to go to an LP and said, hey, it would really help my business if I could create Jay's pre-rolls. Um, I'm going to pay you, you know, you'll brand a Jay's pre-rolls. Obviously, you have to, it's also funny because the OCS just went through this whole flow through program and trying to figure out how this was going to work right. and clearly that clearly that's not going to be the case anymore um and it was really in my view a benefit for the retailer as opposed to trying to get a wedge in by the lp and i said as much to the agco after i said you know i understand it uh, but i don't really understand it and the sense i got and this wasn't said to me explicitly is that i don't think i think this just kind of got captured the white labeling component got captured in a general prohibition on what you can do with an LP to try to remove vertical integration. And I don't think, and this is my own personal view, that the AGCO fully appreciated why retailers want these white label agreements, because if they did, they might reconsider. And I still think there's a chance for it to be reconsidered, maybe not before June 30th or maybe before June 30th. But um, so the white labeling definitely st st stuck out to me because it kind of, doesn't fit the mold of what they're trying to achieve. Lucas, you're nodding. It also seems to me that it puts these retailers who are now in extreme competition, right, uh, with each other. Uh, it takes one of the things that they did have away from them to compete or or draw differentiation among their their neighbors, quite literally, or mm -hmm. you know, figuratively, other others, or even draw distinction between them and you know other online sellers. Like it's it's really. It seems to me that may, and I don't want to say anybody's misguided, but it also sort of contravenes, as Matt was saying, what the OCS flow through program, which I thought was sort of part of it was about this, right? Yeah, what this I think does, in, in my opinion, to build on Matt's points there is uh, it, it tightens up, I think, how LPs and retailers can interact. 
And because we're now seeing the kinds of agreements that they can have in place defined to, you know, a set of five different kinds of agreements, you know, that sort of uh, white labeling agreement could somehow now be leveraged uh, in, in sort of an alternate agreement, you know, with sort of some sort of hidden intention, I guess, with either the LP or the retailer there. So I, I think by removing this, it, it, it tightens things up for now. And it's kind of like the AGCO signaling, okay, let's pause on this while we vibe on these new uh, standards coming out and then maybe revisit the conversation. I certainly think that this could be something that could be revisited and I, I hope it is because you know as we know retailers buying cannabis from lps doesn't hurt the industry right and can we just go to that for a second because um i, I want to part of this is the the intention of what was being done and how to fix that around inducements or what was perceived as inducements between producers and retailers lucas can you talk a little bit about that like what what has been being done in practice and is that still kosher and there's lots of conversation both here at the retail series but you know, back channel too about, you know, paying for data or, um, you know, refrigerators in store and pay, like, talk a little about what, what in practice had been done and is that going to change or just now going to get a blessing? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great point. So those are, are two parts under 6.5 that we can uh, we can address. So a licensee may enter into an agreement to sell its data for business or intelligence purposes. Um, so what we had seen before in the past is uh, LPs were paying the retailers large amounts of money basically for nothing, and you know saying that it was data based on 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 something that was happening in the store in terms of sales. So that's now been tightened up. Now when we're talking about uh, um, you know, if we're going on to talk about, for example, like nominal uh, items that can be given, basically swag, you know, and they even go on in the guidance document to say that swag can actually still be used as an inducement, um, depending on the frequency in which it's given and uh, and the amounts, you know, maybe it's nominal in one time, but if it's over a long period of time, you know, that starts to be not nominal as well. So they're giving some sort of definition as to sort of what, what those things could be and, and how that can be used and what frequency they could be given. So uh, I think very important to make sure that these, uh, you know, uh, retailers uh, uh, opinions are, are not being swayed. Yeah. So, the, so the, the idea is the retailers opinions are not being swayed because things are nominal, you know, whereas one hat might be fine. 5,000 hats in store might not be fine. like I'm, I'm being exaggerating, but is that, is that really what we're focused on here? Yeah, I mean, the onus is also going to be on the retailer too to record and document any kind of gifts that they're they are receiving. So that's also going to be important. It was before it was just sort of a you know, blind transaction that sort of happened, and no one really thought too much about it. So you know, proper record keeping is going to be more strictly enforced when this comes in into June thirtieth. And uh, you know, there 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 could be some investigation. It, it's likely they might not find a lot of things. But yeah, to your point about fridges too, um, that that's that's definitely considered not nominal. That that certainly is, you know, considerable uh, at, at, at that point. And we've, we've heard stories about, you know, for example, folks from the OCS saying, well, if you reach out to these LPs, they might be able to help you with some equipment for your store, oh. uh, which is strictly forbidden now uh, and in, in these new, new sets of standards coming out. And whether that's branded or unbranded equipment like refrigerators, uh, that would certainly be, uh, be excluded from any kind of agreement that you can have. So uh, my advice to any retailer that might have received any of these, branded or unbranded gifts uh, is that they should immediately remove them from their premises um, and, uh, you know, ensure that they're not subject to, uh, to enforcement action in June 30th when this, uh, this comes live. Well, it's going to be a lot of warm beverages happening. Well, I was just going to say, you know, it's, uh, the, the, the fridges would have been a problem before this, these changes even occurred, you know, like, you know, I talked about earlier, what is a material inducement? Dropping a cooler in your store is probably, you know, probably a material inducement. But, you know, to Lucas's point, um, there was all kinds of things happening in different ways, in different stores with different LPs. Um, and, you know, I guess the question is, what are we trying to prevent as an industry? Like, uh, is it LPs controlling what's in the store? It, it seems like it, because if you look at the exceptions or um, uh, not the exceptions, but sort of the explicit prohibitions, you know, no agreements except for, you know, sort of these exceptions we list out. And then notwithstanding those exceptions, none of those agreements can contain certain other provisions. You know, you can't uh, define how much product from the licensed producer or affiliate will be offered for sale, can't require a defined amount of display space in the retail store, et cetera. So um, clearly they're trying to reduce the meddling um, if you want to put it that way, of LPs in the retail store. And I guess altering the market dynamics of what consumers would want to see on the shelves absent that meddling. 
So that's, that's the not, objective, at least. I, I get that, but I don't. I don't. I, what I don't understand, and I, this is not the conversation. Like, why, why should cannabis be any different than any other industry where where the mm. provider, whether it's going into Walmart's or Shoppers, or th there's a story this week about Frito Lay and Loblaw in a battle about basically the same thing in store around Dorito, Doritos. I'm, I'm only and, I, well, I, and I will say that, you know, part of the AGCOs, and this goes back to July when, when I spoke with them, uh, when the consult was about to come out, they said, you know, they, their concerns, and I don't have full insight into this, although we have clients that are really big and clients that have one store, um, they want an equal playing field between the smaller retailers and the larger ones that have multiple stores. And I get the, their sense is that the bigger chains, brands, whatever you want to call it, or however they're configured, uh, are getting an unfair advantage by virtue of, you know, what they can get from an LP that Jay's Cannabis store might not be able to acquire because uh, no one wants to give those same benefits to you because there's not as much bang for their buck once they give it to you. I understand. Yeah. I understand that. Great point. Yeah. It's a big win for small business, Jay. And, you know, I, I think one point that I'd like to squeeze in before we go off from this mm -hmm. one is, you know, if we think of about a very specific example um, where an LP, you know, has a large stake or a, a strong affiliation with a retail store, right? And typically those kinds of arrangements that we saw in the past were about limiting shelf space from that one LP that was sort of involved in this uh, affiliation agreement agreement uh, to that particular LP. And now these kinds of agreements will not be able to uh, to exist uh, under these new standards. Yeah. When it's and it just sorry, I'm, I know we got other points to get to, but, but piggybacking on that, you know, it's sort of interesting because one of the exceptions is that um, a licensed producer can enter into a franchise agreement. So you, an LP could franchise the, the name and, and whatnot, which um, you know, it's interesting because the LP can't own the store, but they could, I guess, now brand it and have their own, their own, um, their own stores. But inherent in a franchise relationship is the notion that the franchisor has control or significant assistance over what products should be ordered, what shelf space, what it should all look like. So there's a carve out for franchise agreements, but then it turns around and says, well, despite that, these carve outs, um, you know, you can't define, like I said before, the amount of product that a licensed producer must be offered for sale or displays, display space, um, you know, what is, what is it going to look like? So it, it actually creates an interesting little dynamic. And I'm curious to see how existing franchise agreements might play out because some of them certainly speak to a franchisor, which in some cases, well, I would say indirectly from an, a licensed producer, um, speaks to things like what products can go in the store, what the shelving and the advertising should look like. That's the whole point of doing the franchise. So it's right. there's a lot of interesting quirks that sort of are going to play out with this once it comes in June 30th. So they just can't write that down now is what it means. I mean, they're still supplying a lot of the capital. There still could be in lease agreements with these folks, uh, but they just have to strike any kind of language or clauses in their current agreements or create a new agreement that doesn't have that kind of language in it. That sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot of good work for both of you. Um, <laughs> which is, I mean, but, but it's. I mean, the other part that that this speaks to, whether you are a one shop or many, is, um, and it, it's spelled out. I think, and Matt, I want to go to you first. Is is about in store advertising or in store marketing or shelf space or displays, because I think we've all been to lots of stores and some you know, are basically branded, the whole store is branded in 17 different brands and some it's branded in one and everything else is everything else. Talk a little bit about what the new guidance says around that or if it says anything. Well, you know, look, in-store advertising for money was always frowned upon or beyond frowned upon, it was prohibited. Um, you know, the AGC will come right out and say, you can't, you can't sell shelf space. You can't um, sell advertising within the store. Um, and then I'm looking over, you know, the, the list over here on my other screen about, you know, you can't enter into agreements. So what, what are the four sort of things that they explicitly say you can't do? You know, you can't define the agreements, can't define the amount of product from the licensed producer or its affiliate that must be offered for sale. Number two, uh, can't require a defined amount of display space in the store uh, to be dedicated to product from the licensed producer. Uh, number three, it can't provide merchandising, marketing, or promotional activities to the licensed producer or its affiliate, or, or four, the agreement can't restrict the ability of the licensed producer or its affiliates to sell its product to other retail stores or the ability of the retailer to sell products from other licensed producers. So, 
you know, really they're trying to um, create that equal playing field by saying, you know, what should go into your store in terms of product is what consumers are asking for. And, you know, what, what, the, what makes sense for you as a retailer to sell as opposed to you're getting some money from a licensed producer for advertising and therefore you've got to dedicate a certain amount of shelf space. You've got to do certain things like they're really trying to get away from that. Um, and so in-store advertising, you know, it's been, I've got many, many questions about it over the years and it was clear a while back that you just couldn't do that. Um, it's interesting because sometimes we get questions and say, well, can we put up, you know, just for aesthetic purposes, logos of the, of the licensed producers in the store. And it's like, well, if they're not paying you for it, sure. Like, and they're not asking for it too now. Yeah. Because, because any is some, right. Even just saying display a logo is, you know, a quantity. (laughs) One is, one is a quantity. So uh, that's got to be struck as well. Um, One thing I want to go back here in in the standard 6.6, where we're talking about, and and Matt just mentioned this, restrict the ability of other licensed producers or affiliates to sell product at retail store or other retail stores. So what this means is that you can't really have any exclusive products that you're featuring at a retail store, which I think is another standard that kind of actually hurts the retailer more than it does the LP by not having these exclusive offerings uh, again making differentiation hard if we're going down queen west you know who, who's got the who's got the best product they all have the exact same product right and but that goes back to the white labeling as well if you could have your own jay's cannabis premium cannabis only here great which was i think thought the flow through program but uh, okay so this uh, this is not confusing i'm not saying that it just it's it's um it's it's the root of what problem we're solving i think is part of the the challenge and then who it benefits versus who it hurts um, is the second part of it. Cause I, I could envision a year from now us having a very similar conversation about new guidelines that contravene whatever that right is. That, that's a legal word contravene these current ones because they don't, they don't do the intended thing they think they're going to do. But one of the things that was interesting, I think was about, let's call it under the rubric of like bud tender education. Um, it is around sampling um, which is, interesting and fun. So maybe it's under education and training and samples. Do I have that right? Is that one category? Is these like totally separate things, Lucas? Yeah. So they, they've, they've obviously experienced the AGCO has heard reports about uh, LPs coming down and, and providing samples to, uh, to bud tenders. And, you know, with these new standards, it really defines not just how the operator uh, the store owner and the managers interact with the LP, but also how the bud tenders and the LPs can interact as well. Um, so we, we've seen examples of for, you know, uh, promoting sales for a particular LP at the bud tender level where they'll drop off an Xbox to whoever has the highest you know, brand X sales that week, right? And that's going to be something that can be potentially looked at if, if, if that's uncovered, that would certainly be enforced. Uh, but it, it, in addition to that, you know, offering trainings now is something that, that also is sort of captured here. But I think there's a misunderstanding as to sort of how this could be interpreted. So the registrar standards were never written with the intent to allow for travel and accommodation and meals over several days. And let's say there was an LP in British Columbia who was paying for a retail store in Ontario, Toronto, you know, to come to their site. I mean, that's not really something the AGCO has, has considered. Presumably if the costs were, were moderate, you know, they flew economy, they were eating at, you know, um, I guess sort of like, you know, a low Earl's. level restaurant. That's yeah, good. Earl's or actually maybe even Earl's could be considered <laughs> nice by their standards. But, um, you know, the standards weren't, weren't built for something like that. You know, even just taking a team down to Niagara Falls, unless there was an LP actually at Niagara Falls, they couldn't just sort of conduct their training, you know, on their brand and, and, and products at a site unless it was sort of like with the intention of, of, of touring there or it was local. So it's, it's really intended for these trainings to be local. Um, they're not supposed to be providing these lavish meals at really nice restaurants. It's really, they're expecting, for example, a tray of sandwiches and like, you know, refreshments, like light refreshments as well, not, uh, not an open bar uh, at, at some club. And you can't follow that up by taking the, uh, the bud tenders, for instance, to a hockey game if the LP is paying for that. So you, you certainly could sort of have these, uh, 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 these things sort of happen at a training session, um, but sort of who's paying for what, who's picking up the check is definitely going to be looked at. Yeah. So it's, so it's, I could have a training like the downtown Sheraton on, on university but I couldn't do the bud tender BAMF retreat training. Well, it's, it's funny you say that because again, when I spoke to them last July, they said, you know, there's going to be a carve out, you know, they, 
I didn't say they, they said there was going to be, they were thinking about it, um, you know, based on what the feedback was going to be for education. And they actually, I remember the phone call, they said, you know, you would take them to the Swiss Alps skiing, that's probably not going to fly, right? And so we're trying to find, or the AGCO is trying to find a balance between allowing, you know, permissible activity, which is educating on products while not opening the door too much to allow it to be exploited. But it, it does, as to Lucas's point, it's going to create some interesting scenarios because, you know, it's one thing to um, rent a school bus and drive everyone up to Smith Falls to see Canopy's facility. Um, it's another thing to pay for plane tickets and fly everyone out to Moncton to see Organogram. But if that's the only way you can get out there, is that still permissible? Like, is the plane ticket that much worse than the bus ticket? Um, you know, or or could could Canopy? I can't remember how far Smith Falls is outside of Ottawa, but I know it's not too far. You know, could you fly him to Ottawa instead on Porter and then bus him from there? Like, it's. I, I think you know one thing that's been consistent some since the start, for better or worse, is that everything's case by case basis, right? So it's like we're going to look at what you're doing. You know, what's the rationale? What are you offering? We're going to make decisions, and they're going to have to do that when these standards come in because there's going to be a wide variety of um, ways that LPs are going to try to implement the education aspect, I think. Um, Matt, can I stick with you for one second? Because I, and I don't want to run through every possible scenario, but if I am a brand rep from a producer or a brand and you are a bud tender, Matt Maurer, bud tender, um, can I bring uh, pre-rolls into you as a sample? Yes, um, you know, they put in the guidance documents that samples are okay, but the expectation is that they'll be infrequent. So again, they're, what is infrequent, who knows, but the idea is that the samples aren't showing up every, you know, twice a week for the entire uh, uh, staff. Um, but the, but also know, how many samples there, Matt, too? I mean, if you're coming down with 100 pre-rolls, we're, we're past nominal, like it's basically single serving. Right. And, and you know, and they do say it's it's supposed to be a strain that's available in Ontario because otherwise, what are you sampling it for? Um, I'm just seeing if they you know put in some other things there, but um, samples, yeah, sample size small in quantity, a particular strain available in Ontario, um, and should be received infrequently. So, and to Lucas's point too, you know, how many employees do you have? How many bud tenders do you have? Are you coming with a, a crate of pre rolls for Jay's cannabis when there's only two employees? Um, and again, I think it's you know, for better or worse, the AGCO or Health Canada, whoever's going to really enforce this, um, are going to have to take a long, hard look at, you know, specific details on certain things. But even acquiring those specific details would be a challenge, even with the record keeping requirements. And is there going to be an interest in, you know, pulling and auditing records from a year ago to see if everything's good? I don't know. Um, we know the AGCO has got a lot of work to do, and um, I don't know how many people are working there now, but anyone that's applied for a license could tell you they could use some more people um, as hard as they work. So it's, it's you know, a lot of it's, it's almost like when legalization happened and we had all these rules written down, until it gets on the ground, it's kind of hard to say how some of this is going to fully play out. And, and actually, Lucas, to that point, like, are there, are there new SOPs that you are talking to retailers about, about accepting samples or accepting um swag or you know like are there new things that retailers need to be thinking about that if a brand rep comes in and has you know a package of edibles for everybody here's how we intake that account for that like is that right. a thing now yeah we certainly have documentation that that speaks to these kinds of things and the sops that we provide you know these things are, are relatively well laid, or will be relatively well laid out on the agco's website as well uh, and they've actually come up with a guidance document with this new change of, of standards or the addition of standards uh, as well. The guidance document is, I guess, sort of relatively well written, but yes, you know, this should be part of their, their inventory and record keeping, you know, accepting these samples. So there should be forms for this, whether they're digital or uh, in paper, and uh, these should be available to uh, the AGCO inspectors when they come by to do compliance and enforcement checks and audits at these stores as well. So certainly that, that should be part of all, uh, uh, all operators sort of mindset is, uh, is making sure that this uh, uh, does get uh, does get documented, you know, and especially as it pertains to going back to that conversation on data sharing as well. Um, if if 
retailers and LPs sort of have an arrangement for data sharing, you know, that is something that we would strongly recommend does become formalized into an official agreement and that the prices do ref reflect uh, nominal value. Again, there, there's an opportunity there. You know, we, we've talked a lot about cannabis research licenses for, for sensory studies, which would allow for an LP to pay a retailer um, you know, to, to host these events, you know, in, in an area in which they're licensed for, uh, for research activities by Health Canada to consume those products there and then sell that data back to the LP. So, I mean, that's an opportunity there for retailers. So uh, if, if there are folks with those agreements, get those in place. And just hopping on the data, the, the one thing in the guidance, you know, it says it's got to be a fair market value. And the question is, well, what is fair market value and, and who's going to decide that? Because, um, some people would argue, depending on the data you're getting, it's incredibly valuable. Uh, you know, it tells you who's by it, depending on how it's collected. It's not just we sold this many pre-rolls this month and it was from this company and that many from, you know, the other company. If you're sophisticated enough and your rewards program is, is you know, uh, sophisticated enough, um, you can find out, you know, how far your customers live from your store, what time they're coming in, uh, when are beverages being sold? What day of the week are they being sold? How old are the people that are buying those beverages? And that can be, you know, critically valuable to the LPs, um, you know, and it's also quite valuable to the retailers, but there's, there's, you know, there's, it's going to be hard, I think, to figure out what fair market value is for, for its certain data. I think can, so can I can I jump on that point too? Sure. Because there's a great thing that Matt actually just brought up, and that's that this information sharing, this data sharing, can actually happen both ways, uh, and that's something that I don't think the AGCO has completely fleshed out yet. So we, we've seen a lot of products online on the OCS website or on retailers' websites where there'll be like a range of THC, maybe like fifteen percent to twenty-five percent. You know, with this new like information sharing arrangement, you know, the LPs could really be tipping off the retailers. Oh, by the way. You know, we've got a few lots and batches with the OCS right now with 25% THC for this particular strain type. So if you're looking for those products, you know, make sure to buy those up because you'll be sure what you're getting. And typically what's happening on the website is if it's in range for 15 to 25%, what arrives to the retailer could really be anything. And the 15%, as we know, according to buying habits, will move a lot slower and occupy your shelf space. Wow. Okay. So Lucas and Matt, first of all, thank you for your expertise and and uh, not reading the big print, the small print, internalizing it uh, and talking to us about it because that's super helpful. Thank you for your partnership too. You're going to stick around and we'll see you in the breakout room, but I really want to thank you. And I know that people have questions because I can see them asking questions and pinging me about them. So thank you. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you for sharing. We'll, we'll uh, see you in a few minutes. All right. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Lucas, and thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you, Krista, before that. On the left-hand side of your screen, you will see it says sessions. It'll light up. It'll say live. You'll join us there. You can share your camera and microphone or just stay in the chat and observe. You can ask questions and have the speakers and presenters answer those questions. Or, or and, if you'd like to network, we'll open up the one-on-one -on -one networking where you can serendipitously be matched up with another cannabis professional looking to connect. Finally, we have tons of programming coming up. Visit our events page on our website, businessofcannabis.com, to find out more. But importantly, end of note, on anybody who wants to do a quick trip to New York, Business of Cannabis New York sessions on March 10th, that's two weeks from today, we'll be talking about connecting social equity applicants in New York with capital. Uh, stay tuned as well for our March retail series, which we will be announcing uh, beginning of next week. You'll see it in your email box. We're going to be talking about preparing your retail operation for the all important 420 holiday. More on that again in your emails uh, tomorrow. Thank you again for being here and please visit us at businessofcannabis.com or find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and, and our new YouTube channel, all of which is linked in this email uh, where all of this program will also be uploaded tomorrow. So if you wanna watch in slow motion tomorrow, that's cool. If you wanna really fast forward through my parts, that's cool too. You can watch at one and a half time speed. It'll be uploaded tomorrow. Thank you, and we will see you in the breakout session or in the networking. Thank you for joining us here at Business of Cannabis Retail Session. Thank you again to Vitrina Group and to Leafly and to Matt and to Lucas from Torque and Mains and Can Delta, respectively. We look forward to seeing you down the road.